Hey everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Bible Discoveries, the weekend show. My name's Corey and I'm here with my husband, Matlock. Hey Matlock. Hey, what's going on? Well, uh, if this is your first time here, we are going through the Bible this year. <laughs> I just realized I normally put that in the beginning, but yeah. I didn't. So here we go. Uh, this is on this program, we're going through the Bible in a year. So we take everything that we were supposed to read from Monday to Sunday, and that's what we're looking at on this show specifically. And we're going to be asking viewer questions, Bible questions, discussion questions about that area in the scripture, kind of give you a diving board off into further thought or further study on your own. So yeah, would want to let them know what we were supposed to read? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, I need to take a drink of water and stop yeah. talking. Well, <laughs> yeah. Second Chronicles. Now today's, this week is the last time of the perfect books because technically it goes first chapter one to 32 uh, and it's yes. 36 chapters in Second Chronicles. Right. So we were enjoying a spree of it being like, Read First Kings this week. That's right. Read it was Kings perfect. This That's week. right. Yeah, not the case anymore. Anyway, so not it's over. Case. So, That's Corey, okay. I'm going to let, list off the first question. Sure. Okay. It is a Bible question regarding Second Chronicles five. Okay. Is the style of worship music used in church today in any way like the worship music used in the Bible? And the reference specifically regards to Second Chronicles five, verses eleven to thirteen. And I, I'm assuming it's because the instruments here are cymbals, harps, lyres, right? Uh, trumpeters, and um, yeah, and other musical instruments. So, Corey? And they're singing in unison. That's right. Okay, so um, from my subjective, limited human experience, I'm going to go with no. It's not similar, it's at true. least in my church. <laughs> they're yeah. no, yeah. no. Um, there are similarities to biblical worship, especially when the songs that are sung incorporate scripture in them. Um, you know, there's there's some songs and hymns that we sing that have psalms incorporated in them. So in that way, there's definitely that connection. Um, but I think in many ways, our church, our modern church services are extremely different than the temple the daily temple rituals that would be going on in, you know, the second temple or the first temple period. Um, and I think that's pretty obvious when you read through. Maybe yeah. if you're in a more liturgical church, it might feel similar in that there's always, um, like always the same songs are sung and always it's at certain times and they get more orchestrated and more coordinated. Uh, but I think by and large, very different than what temple worship would have looked like. And that's not a bad thing, I don't think. Right. Because it's a different kind of ceremony. No, like I hear not you. everyone these these the, the, the ceremonies in the temple, the, yeah. the daily ceremonies in the temple aren't public things. Right. Like it's not something that You're talking about the order and the arrangement of things. Yeah. What about the sound of it? Would the sound of the music you think be the same? Because Unsure. Unsure. Unclear. Right. Unclear. There's there's historical discontinuity, right? Yeah. Between the time period of the Old Testament and now. I mean, even with even with liturgical services, when you look in in Judaism, there was that break where there was no temple in the time period of the Babylonian exile. So that would be a smaller gap that would need to be closed. But then when the temple was destroyed again in AD 70, and it still has not yet been right. um, repaired, not that certain festivals and things haven't been adapted to within Judaism, uh, you know, for use without a temple, but that element of it is missing now. So there's right. a huge disconnect between um, between the the historical temple services right. and what happens today. You could make a case, and this is a very limited case, that harps, stringed instruments, some people uh, don't allow stringed instruments in worship services, depending what kind of church you go to, but right. clearly right. there's stringed, stringed instruments here. Yeah, um, and symbols kinds, like yeah. something on the drums or something. Um, so yeah, uh, I would say yeah. I they were, you see all the popular musical instruments of the day being used in worship, which is right. really cool. Right, like all the music, uh, all all the musics, all of the instruments that you would see. You know, right. that you see it in the in in the pagan records. You see here being used in the Bible for the worship of God, which is very cool. Right. Yeah, I yeah. think that's interesting to note too. Yeah, I think so. All right. But yeah, there's a lot of historical discontinuity, so it's hard to be like, this is exactly what it sounded yeah. like. If or, only music sheets were written, uh, used in the time. If only. If only then we know for only, sure. If only. I right. know. It's hard enough for people to put together um, music that was written down in the Middle Ages because it's a different system. Yeah, now, that's right. right? With but the hurdy -gurdy. They still, 
They still do it. Anyway, I want to move on. Let's ask let's you, because I'm not an expert in this, but let's ask you this next question. Okay, sure. Second Chronicles 5. Does scripture teach Christians should expect a glory cloud of God or members of the church to be slain in the spirit? Okay, so this is literally the next couple of verses, verses 13 to 14. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can I read it? Please. All right. So when the song was raised with the trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Um, okay, and this deals with Second Chronicles 5. So what we, what we see here is that should we expect a glory cloud every time we go to a church? I'm just going to say no. As, as, yeah, no, I, I think I, I think experientially, like with the scripture, yeah. when you look at the scripture anecdotally, when you look and you see, this only happens a couple times. Right. I mean, it does happen a couple times. Yeah. In the wilderness wandering period and at the what? building of Solomon's temple, but it doesn't even happen in, this, in the building of the second temple, I don't think. No, no, that's actually a huge difference. Yeah. So actually, okay. Not to rant about this for too long, but one of the reasons why the Essenes and some of the other people in the Second Temple period didn't believe the Second Temple built like, with Ezra and everyone else, uh, Nehemiah, was legitimate was because God never refilled the temple. Right. So that in was the same way. In yeah. the same way. So they were like, like, look, it's not. It gave the them the excuse that they needed to be able to be like, we reject it all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So anyways. Um, so I would say, I'm going to say, yeah, it doesn't really happen very the often. The answer to the question, should we expect a the glory cloud no. every time? The answer, the, well, it doesn't say every time. Oh. But I'm saying no every time. But we just shouldn't expect it in general. Like, I mean, it could happen. It could, but I'm going to say but 99. But it's been very <laughs> rare historically for <laughs> like it to happen. Twice. Like twice. So. Um, but it would be very cool. Yeah, it would be but cool. Yeah, yeah but it should rare. be something like. You know, I've seen things online with like glitter coming down and all this stuff and people just making up a cloud. I don't know if they're high on drugs, but maybe. Could be the, maybe. Anyways, uh, so I'm going to say no. Um, uh, and then certain members of the church expect to be slain in the spirit. And here it says so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. So in other words, oh. so it's like they, I guess they fell down. And they've been Hold slain. on. No, 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 no. I never thought that that was a slain in the spirit reference. I just thought that that was they could not enter the temple. They could not stand in the temple because it was too cloudy. Corey, they could not stand. No, I think that means I think that means they couldn't go in and minister. Okay, well, I believe you. Because there's other well, areas Corey, where people are, hold on, you're laughing at me, but I'm like, wait, no, I'm I don't I'm not laughing that, at you. I agree with you. I don't think that's what that means there. Okay, I agree with you. This, but this is the there question. are other times where prophets fall as the if question. they're dead. <laughs> Okay. Right. Whoever right. made the question. There are other times <laughs> where prophets, like they have a vision and they fall as if they're dead because right. they're overwhelmed with the glory of God and, and the vision that they're experiencing. Right. But I don't think that that's what it's talking about here. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I just don't think it's been saying the spirit. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I yeah. I just don't think like... People normally take a really, from what I've observed, people normally take like a really hard stance on being slain in the spirit. Right. I am not comfortable taking that. Like there's some people who are like, absolutely not. It's demonic or it's fake or it's this. I am not willing to go there because there are examples in the scripture of people falling as if they were dead. Right. So I'm not going to be like, it is demonic. It is this. It is that. I'm not doing that because I don't think it's wise according well, to the scripture. It just, yeah, I think it depends how it is. If someone's getting slain every time they go, and it's like a perpetual thing. You made maybe it like have a you really, made it like a habit. Maybe they have a really easily easily faint. What is that called? Maybe they faint easily. I don't know. God can overpower someone and make them and, and knock them down as if they're dead. Yes, yeah. no, the Holy Spirit can do that. He's actually killed people, so I yes. don't see why he can't knock them out. But my point is like acts I'm referring to. Um, but uh, in terms of this case, I don't think it's making a case for being slain at all. Me neither. Because, right? I don't think it's just because even if someone could not stand in the temple, like. So hypothetically, if they couldn't just be, not be in there, but could not stand, because it was, it doesn't mean that they're slain in the spirit. It doesn't mean one doesn't. How did they get out. Did they crawl? Did they just lay there? They just lay there. It does not. That's not they what that means. They just lay there. That's what I'm saying. Even if that's the case, the text is not saying that's what I'm saying. Okay. Even if the text did mean they could not stand, like if their legs were like jelly. Right. It does not mean they were slain. It does not say that. That's what I'm saying. I think probably so, when you saw the smoke emanating from the holy of holies, you'd probably walk out. I mean, I'm not a high priest or anything, but I'd walk out. 
Yeah. Or if I, if I saw like, I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. It says, but specifically, it says so that the priests could not stand to minister. They could not stand to minister. Yeah. They can't so go they in can't, there. But minister specifically, like, do their do their, their duties. Their they duties, need to yeah. light the lamps. They need to put the incense. I, I they need to do the fire. They can't stand to do that. I, I know. Because they can't see. I, I agree. They'd have, they'd have to crawl. Or maybe they're yeah. just overwhelmed emotionally. <laughs> Stop it. Okay, anyways. So, yeah, I was going to say no. <laughs> no. I'm just going to say no across the board. We don't need to get into the same the spirit stuff. No, maybe, that's, maybe that's, that's a different, different topic for, yeah, that's a different topic. For another day. But I don't think that's what that means here. No, it just doesn't. It yeah. just doesn't. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question then. We're going to move on. Sure. Second Chronicles 22, 2 Kings 8 is the reference for this. Okay. The Bible says King Ahaziah was 42 oh. when he began his reign. It's another Bible contradiction. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And that's in 2 Chronicles 22. Okay. But the Bible also says... That King Ahaziah was 22 when his reign began. And that's right. in 2 Kings 8. If the Bible is truly perfect and inerrant and only tells the truth, Matlock, how is this possible? And that's from Muhammad. Okay. Well, this is the third week in a row we've dealt with another contradiction. Yes. And it's always just like me giving the same answer because the numbers, scribal errors, third time, right? Um, the original autograph, the original text that was written was inspired by God and perfect. And then we have been copying it down to Pete, the church for generations, right? We've been copying it down. And it's sometimes numbers, it's 99% of the time it's numbers that get uh, mistakenly uh, transcribed. Um, and mistakes you know, happen, scribal errors happen with numbers very often. And so sometimes numbers can be mistaken. I think this is one of those cases. Um, the Bible says that King Isaiah was 42 when his reign began, um, as opposed to 22. Um, so I think that's all this is. It's just a matter of saying, the four, you know, instead of writing down a two two, someone wrote down a four two, and then that's what happened. Um, it says nothing about whether the Bible's inerrant or not telling the truth, and nothing like that. It just simply means a scribal error over the thousands of manuscripts that have been passed down, right? And, and from rabbi to you go down the list to yeah. uh, uh, monk, right? They've somewhere down the line, this has become the dominant. Uh, a uh, scribal error that has dominated the most manuscripts. And so people have documented this, being like, look, it says this. That's all it is. And, but it doesn't, it's not making a mistake because it's copying it from an earlier source. The earlier source is, in this case, Second Kings. So Chronicles is literally copying it from Second Kings, right? And it's like, oh, that then it just so happens down the line, for thousands of years of being copied, a mistake has crept in. Um, that's all it is. So notice nothing theologically changes here. This is like someone's age. Oh, yeah. the, right. so it's like so. It's really not a big deal, and and it is a it is a um, mistake in the Masoretic text, from what I understand. Right, the Masoretic text says forty two, but the Septuagint still says twenty two, and that's right. So Septuagint. it's a scribal error, right, in one of the um, Manus manuscript copy manuscript the, families. Of that's copies. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. So that's all it is, and then which is why in most English Bibles it just says twenty two, and then there's a asterisk. there's an asterisk, and you go down and it says, but in yeah. the Masoretic text it says. So again, this doesn't change. Like again, we, we read the Bible in English; it has been translated again. So it's like, yeah. It's been, see what I'm saying? It's so, like these, so. This is a this is the difference in understanding of like what inerrancy is, and I, and there's a lot of people who will be like, ha ha, it's not inerrant, which is what Muhammad is trying to do here, either trying to have us like that gotcha moment, or because he's heard it from someone else and now is actually genuinely asking, right. which is totally fine. Either way is totally fine. But inerrancy is not that every single thing has to be perfect in the copies, but it's what it's 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 two things. First, the original the original autographs of the Bible were inerrant in every way. But then second, that the scripture is still inerrant in the truth that it conveys to us because it's been specially protected by God. That's what Christians right. believe. Um, and and we, because we have so many copies and so much of a history, we are able to trace it back. So if you know anything about um, like the literary criticism of the Bible, you can go back and you can track it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and it's funny because it's, it's Christians who are like, oh, this is, who are trying to figure out if it's a mistake or not. Yeah. So they go through, they, they assess all the manuscripts, they see what, what family and where they come from. They're like, oh, it looks like this crept in somehow. And then they just, you know, they fix these mistakes as they go along. So anyways, I think that's interesting. But yeah, I say that's the answer to the question. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, Corey. Next question. Yes. All right, this pertains to 2 Chronicles 32 and 2 Kings 19. Okay. 
And then another Bible contradiction. I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm looking at. Painful. Up. Okay. In 2 Kings 19, 37, it states that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, was killed by his sons while he was worshiping in the temple of his god. Yes. However, according to 2 Chronicles 32, 21, it was his own son who killed him after he fled from his own land. Which account is correct? Yes. Both accounts are correct. <laughs> So all these Bible contradictions work. It's like they can just, they're not mutually exclusive accounts. Go ahead, explain it. Both correctly. accounts are correct. He went back to his own land where the temple of his God was, goes in there to worship, and his sons come in and kill him. He even says that in Second Chronicles 3. I'm, I'm like, if you go to say, okay. It, it says that in Second Chronicles 33 as well. That's why I'm confused. Second no, Chronicles 33. I just don't think that's a contradiction. 33 think, says, and when he came into the house of his God, some of his own sons struck him down there right. with a sword. That's Second Chronicles 32, verse 22. And it says the same thing in Second, Second Kings, Kings 19. Um, but interestingly, it also says this in the Assyrian records. Right. There we go. It, it says this in the Assyrian records. It talks about him being murdered um, in the house of his own God by his own son. Some of these contradictions are usually just like, like three word answers. Which is it? Yeah, was he in the temple it? or was it by and his sons? Like and it's usually, like, okay, guys. for the most part, it's both. Especially the account ones, not the number ones, but the ones that are just like, it's like, well, just use your mind here. Can these things, can these events happen like one yeah. then the other? That's the that's the beef that I have with the skeptics Bible. Have you ever gone on to the skeptics Bible? Well, these, these questions I'm sure come from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. probably, if you guys have like, if you go on to the skeptics Bible, they point out like every little minute detail that doesn't make sense. But 99% of them, maybe, maybe that's an over-exaggeration, I don't know. But me reading through that, I'm like, oh, because they're not using their brains to be like, does, does this make like, what is it trying to say? They're just yeah. being like very wooden with their understanding and it's very yeah. frustrating. I agree It's very you. frustrating. It's like maybe read two more sentences and that would clear up for you. Right. Not that there's a bad question if it's a sincere question, but something like the skeptics Bible is trying to be skeptical for the sake of being skeptical yes. so that they have content to put their, out there. Oh, the I know. Yeah. But anyway, if you're happy with that, like both of those things actually do move say on. the same thing. I and think the Assyrian record It's the too. last of the contradictions. We put those to bed for this week. Thank God. Done. Yeah. They really right. get you, eh? You're just well, frustrated I'm just, with I, it. I, well, when there's so many of them weeks in a row, you just get tired of them because it's like, <laughs> I'm just giving the same answers every time, basically. I guess. I, guess. And it's like, I just don't feel like answering it. There's no like special I feel like there's some, though, that do have interesting answers and interesting, but a lot of them don't. Yes. Unfortunately, for you guys who are listening to it. Okay. Second Chronicles <laughs> 28, Matt Locke. Let oh, me give sure, you something sure. different. Okay. Why did God judge the nation of Israel for the actions of its king? Why did one ma man affect all men? And did God judge other nations in the same way? Okay. So this is based off Second Chronicles 28, 19. Do you want me to read it? Uh, sure. It says, For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had made Judah act sinfully and had been very unfaithful to the Lord. Okay. So um, okay, in, in here specifically, the king initiates a law. The law is evil. People enjoy the evil law and they indulge themselves in this evil law and then they act sinfully. So the king's one action led to the sin of a whole nation in this context. And therefore, that's why one man affects all people because that's, it's, it's reciprocal in this case. And it's, in terms of a king, maybe not in our democratic system today, in terms of a king, it's, it's reciprocal. Um, so also too, it's why Jesus Christ could die for us. One man, like Adam, right? Adam, one man's sin affects all, all men. Oh, Christ's one, one death and resurrection is atoned for us all. So, because he's the king of kings. So, I think theologically there's merit there. Um, and because we are his uh, children, we are God's children, right? We're adopted, we're adopted sons. Christ is the firstborn of all creation. So, now we're in his, we're royal priesthood of his. So, therefore, we're, we're of God. And so, because of that, his actions affect our actions. Like what Christ did on the cross and what he continues to do affect us. So there's there's a relationship there. So I think kingship is a reflection of God's majesty in the world itself. I think that's what it is. I think that's the reason why kingship exists. Anyways, I think I don't think it's the other way around. I don't think we do invent it. Christ didn't just do things because kings existed. It's the other way around because he was always king. Anyways, um, 
does God judge other nations in the same way? God is a, 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 a just judge. He's good. He does, he does not use um, scales that are imperfect or imbalanced. So he will judge justly um, and righteously. Uh, does it, is it the exact same way every single time? I can't guarantee that. It seems like it might be like when Cyrus the Great comes in, right? Like his, whatever he decrees, whatever his decisions were, they affected a nation. When he said, go back to build Jerusalem, right? We rebuild the temple. They were able to. So there's a relationship there, but one king's affecting a whole other nations. Uh, because, of course, as a king, you have control of the nation. That's the idea. Um, it's, it's kind of the basic principle behind it. And then, um, why did God judge the nation of Israel uh, for the actions of its king, for like one man, basically? Um, because, again, they had a reciprocal relationship. Whatever the king did, right? The king was in charge of this nation. So it was essentially it was his. Um, and if he if he went against God, God would judge him. Let's think about the census with, with David. Corey, you can chime in here. Mm -hmm. So David gets a census done, right? And he's not supposed to, it's against God's law. Mm -hmm. And he still does it. He regrets it, but then he goes, Okay, God gives him an ultimatum, right? Mm -hmm. Choose between this and this. He says, I'd rather choose the mercy, you know, I'd rather choose the Lord than the fate of men. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he takes punishment from the Lord. Um in this case, his actions affected the nation, um, largely because it was written in his law not to do them, but because that was what God said would happen. So, again, I think this has to come down to they, the Israelite made a contract when they, when they got a king, saying, we want a person ahead of us. They're like, like, when they wanted a king in the first place, this is part of the kingship process. It's part, it's like built into it. They knew that, that it comes with when a king makes a decision, you know, he'll tax you more. He, he's the head over you. And it's kind of like in a household, if a father makes a decision or whatever, um, it affects the household. So I think that's how that works in my mind. I think, okay, I think in the case of David, yes. And sort of with the other kings of Judah, for right. sure. But specifically with Ahaz, like when we're looking at the hist when we're looking at the biblical context of Ahaz, it wasn't just Ahaz who had sinned. Sure, he led Judah into sin because he went and he got the pagan gods from Syria, Damascus, and set them up in the temple. Right. But there is history within Judah of the priest standing up and saying, "Absolutely not over my dead body." And sometimes they die. Yeah. And sometimes they don't. But in Ahaz's lifetime, they were all like, yeah, okay. Walk right in. Right. Yeah, okay. Let's all and and the and the people chose to follow Ahaz in this idolatrous worship. Probably not all of them, but by and large, they did. And which is why his son Hezekiah had to go on this huge rampage of cleaning up all of the religious structures that his dad had built. Yes. And so and so I think we see with Ahaz Judah's being judged as a whole because the whole people well, went into apostasy. Well, not and even like, 90% of them. Yeah, yeah, like Ahaz Ahaz made the initial decision, but you can stand up and say no. Well, of course. I mean like there's kings that had been murdered by their servants because they started going against God again. They're like absolutely not. Um and I mean doesn't doesn't go well for them every time in Judah, but um, but there there are people who stand up against evil, and there. I mean, an, the, an example of yeah. this is uh, uh, an example of this where this doesn't go well for the righteous people is Manasseh. So Ahaz's grandson Manasseh right. enacts apostasy across Judah. The priests and the prophets of God stand up and say no. Now this this part is Jewish tradition because all it says in the Bible is that. Manasseh filled the streets of Jerusalem with blood. Why would he do that? Well, Jewish tradition tells us that people like Isaiah and a bunch of other godly prophets and a bunch of other priests stood up to Manasseh and said, absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely. God is not going to be with you. Right. And he had them all murdered. Yeah. So like filled the streets. So like in that, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, but like they're still, still affected the participation. by... There's a participation of the people in that. Of course. I'm saying it's reciprocal. But what I'm saying is... The, uh, they're still affected by his judgments. Yes, like definitely. They, that's definitely. what I'm saying. So it's like, the, it's still like this whole king. Right. right that part I totally agree with you on. Yeah. Yes. They, they're completely, so that's even, the way it even works. The even, even today, like we have representational government. 
Right. right? So we hypothetically choose the person, like we yes. vote for people who rule over us. Right. And it's in a different way. They're not quite kings. Right. It's different, but it's similar in the sense that they are making laws and, and policies that we are responsible for morally as a nation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah so I guess what I'm saying is, uh, it's particularly in these cases, is that like, yes, okay, there's some who would repent and not do and fall into them, yeah. but they're still radically affected by what they're doing, what the king's doing. Mm-hmm. If most of the nation didn't go in with it, if they were like, no, we're not doing this, and the king's just making laws, mm-hmm. you wouldn't have, I don't think, the judgment of God or the effect to be the same. It's because most of them are going in with it. Because mm-hmm. because it's just sinful. It's just, when you make a law that's inherently wrong and that it opens up a doorway for sinning, humans are going to take it. Most people won't be able to see it and they're just going to enjoy the sin while it's legal. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's just the way human nature is. Um, so because kings are, and because you accepted a king, Israel did, and because kings are responsible for all the laws, there's that over-under relationship there that they're held to. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in terms of other nations, um, I don't quite know the history of how we deal with other nations personally. Um, but I think it makes sense in terms of this case, you know, especially with God as their king. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are, I guess he was supposed to always be their king, and then they got a king, you know, uh, a king underneath them. Anyways, besides that, yeah, that would be my my thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, any other thing you want to add to that? Nope. Okay, let's just, Corey, I'm going to ask you the last question. Sure. And we're going to, this could be the earliest we could finish off. Maybe not the earliest. We'll see, because I'm not okay. sure, but I, I looked ahead and read yeah. this question, and I'm not sure I understand it, so okay. I don't know. So let me explain. Okay, so we got, there's people that do comment, and they have dialogues and debates. Ha, yes, I get that. Yes. So uh, William Terry Masters, 1934, asked us, um, or not asked us, sorry, Sh- Sheila Alexander, 730. She responded. She responded. Right. But the... the... Uh, no, because here's what it is. I'm so they, confused. Okay, so here's the question. I'm just going to say the, say the question. Okay? <laughs> I'll explain Please it in a second. just say it. Sorry. It's, it's actually wrong how it's listed on here. I'll fix it oh, later. Oh, okay. They won't see the fix. I'll just fix it later. So, good morning. I have a question for any people on this channel. Why use a Bible that is rewritten? He asked this question. William Terry. Yeah. Why use the Bible that is rewritten? Okay? Fair. Then, Sheila responded with, with a comment being like, you know, something. She emailed me saying, hey, can you answer this question more effectively? About the one William Terry's asking. Can you answer? I don't understand the question. Why? I know what it says. Use a Bible that is rewritten. What does he mean by that? Because I feel like, there, does he mean that it's in English? Or does he believe that there's like a grand conspiracy and the Knights Templar rewrote the Bible? Let's go with both angles. we got some time to kill. Or so, I'm trying to understand what there's, he's meaning. There's nothing to understand. This is, this is it. So, yeah. But how do I ask, answer a question that I don't understand the meaning to? Well, okay. people will mudsling and they might not have a, a full understanding. He's heard somewhere that the Bible's been re- rewritten. Okay. Prove it. Okay. Show me where. Where are the receipts? Okay. Another th- way of thinking about rewritten is, is that it's also been... Um, it is in, like, if you read the NIV, it's in modern English. Well, there you go. So does he mean, like, yeah, I'm not yeah, reading it angle. in Greek? So there's, Look, okay. I've only taken a year of Greek. Okay. I'm not... So we know that there's no evidence of it being, quote-unquote, rewritten. Yes. There is evidence of it being edited, right? In the past? In the past. Absolutely. Okay. Names, place names being... Like updated. Okay. Absolutely. We see that in Genesis. We see it in Deuteronomy. We see it in Kings. Okay. For sure, for sure. So. Okay. But like, sorry, Deuteronomy is a rewriting of numbers of the Mosaic law for the generation of people going into the promised land. So how deep do we want to take this? Like, should we just yell at that that generation who was going into the promised land and be like, how dare you read Deuteronomy when Moses' first books should have been enough for you? Like, what? I, I, I'm trying to understand this question because Deuteronomy is a rewriting of the Mosaic law for that generation of people. And then we've got First and Second Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, well, not Ezra and Nehemiah, but First and Second Chronicles for sure being a rewriting of First Kings and Second Kings with a little bit of First and Second Samuel a little smatter, smattered in there. Right. For the new generation of people who are reestablishing Jerusalem. So that's technically a rewriting of the Bible too, but it's done by, by like it was, 
in the canon of scripture that is now closed. So has the Bible been rewritten since the canon of scripture has been closed? No. The reason we know this for the Old Testament using the Dead Sea Scrolls that are dated to about 250 BC or BCE, if that's the way you roll, reckoning it to the right. same date, fine. If that's like, <laughs> when you compare this, the Old Testament scriptures that we have today with the scriptures that date to 2,250 years ago, they're the same. So at what point was that rewritten? And the same with the manuscript, uh, the, the manuscript fragments that we have from the second century AD and the first century AD, they match what we, know, what we have today for the New Testament. And then the, the full copies of the scripture, of the New Testament scriptures, which come in a couple of generations later, there's no differences. So I'm not, that's why I'm struggling to understand what rewritten means because the earliest copies that we have match the copies that we currently have. Now, if he means rewritten in terms of- From one language to another? From one language to another, I read the Bible in English because I speak English. Um, and I believe that, I think it's demonstrable that God's truth transcends language. So God is in English, but he's also not Hebrew. Like he, he, God isn't bound by human language. We're bound yeah. by human language. Um, it says in Revelation that Christ, God, has a crown on his head that only he can read, that only he understands. A name, a name, yeah. Yes, thank you. A name written on his crown that only he understands. Is it on his so, thigh? No. A name written on his thigh? I thought it was, his, no, I think it's his crown. I'm, hmm, I'm, 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 like, I'm like 99. Dude, dude. Dude. No, it's not. I'm 99 percent sure it's a, he has a name. We'll see. He's a name written on his crown that only he understands, only he can read. The point in that is that he has his own language. Right. The point is that he, right, he speaks a certain way that's above our way. So he, God isn't Hebrew. Yeah. So God's above that. So the, yeah. So the point here is that the Holy Spirit, if He indwells you and He works in you, helps you interpret and read the text, mm -hmm. regardless of what, you know, translate. As long as it's faithful to the original manuscript, to the original language, yeah. the original writings. God works through you and helps. And, yeah. that's, and that's what everyone's careful to preserve. Now, there, there are also people who really get bent out of shape over the King James Version versus modern day English. And look, I understand that. I have friends who are really, really like, that's their thing. You have to read the King James Version, otherwise you're perverse. <laughs> that is way too far. Yeah. And and I understand, I understand why that type of mindset is attractive to, 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 to certain people. I get that. But I would challenge you, if that's where you are, William Terry Masters, if, if that's where you are, to actually really look into that concept. Because the more that you challenge it and the more that you actually look into how translations are made, I think you might be persuaded by the evidence that it's not all as well, it, it's not everything that your King James Version only pastor is telling you. Not that they're trying to be malicious. I think that's the, just the tradition that's been handed down to them. And look, if the King James Version is the only version you will ever read, I'm totally fine with that. Just please make sure that you actually are understanding the language. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of words that sound the same, but they don't mean the same thing anymore. What? Like the exact same word in English doesn't mean the same thing today um, in colloquial usage. So that's the reason why it's not a grand conspiracy well, to change yeah. the Bible. These these like modern day translations, it's literally to help people understand what the Bible is intending to say in our own language. So an example of that I've used as often is the word disappoint. Mm -hmm. In Old English, it literally means you're appointed a position, then you're disappointed from that position. So in other words, it does not mean sad. Though, consequently, if you're in a high position and you're disappointed from that position, you would be sad. Mm -hmm. So what's carried over over time in modern English is the feelings, the emotions, and it's lost its functionality, lost mm -hmm. the actual the, the actual physical correspondence to the word. Anyways, so that's example of Old English versus Modern English. But also, too, if you're a King James only, what version of King James? The current King James that you read, let's say on Bible Gateway, is not the same King James. Yeah, it's revised. That was, right? Yeah. It's like over hundreds of times. Because we're so, not perfect. People aren't perfect. And I've seen a lot of the King James movement guys uh, come against the original Greek and Hebrew, the Masoretic and Septuagint. Why? It's kind of like that's very weird. Oh, I know, as if as if that's not inspired, but the King James is. Yeah. So like that to me is kind of like okay, like it's cultish for sure. Oh I'm not man, saying it is. That's I'm saying it's such ish. a mistake. Yeah. Oh, I, 
because it, it it's, it's, it's very much con it's controlling that's, right? it, what you're allowed to it's, and it's controlling access to language which is what i don't like about it because not like a normal person coming to the king james version is going to have a very difficult time understanding what's going on and so then what do you do when you don't understand it you ask your pastor or your elder and yeah. they tell you what the bible means so it's like this gate gateway controlling language that's makes right. them very uncomfortable because that is an earmark and the other difficulty is that is that if you do that, what you're doing is you're reduced, you're reducing God not to speaking to people throughout time. You're reducing God to the Bible itself. Yeah. You're saying yeah. God is this King James Version, and that's it. God cannot escape this right. version only. Right. And so it's like it's a very distorted way of looking at God. So it's like it's just totally But look, maybe I'm completely misunderstanding William Terry Masters' 1934 no, question. Well, we so there is no if <laughs> If he is watching this, no, I feel, I feel we're, like we're giving very much multiple so, answers based on what I'm it could be. I'm trying very much to 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 take your question seriously because I I I'm taking you at your word that it is a serious question, um, and that's great. But I really don't understand what you meant. So if any of these answers weren't actually targeting your question, please follow up and write an explanation of what do you mean by use a Bible that is rewritten. What does that mean to you? And then then that way we can kind of give a more targeted answer. Right. Yeah. Do you have anything else to add? No, I, I think that's good. What do you guys think? Did we do, did we like, what, what do you think about these answers? How would you have answered or, or dealt with some of these? Uh, did you have any other um, issues as you were reading through Second Chronicles that, that popped up for you? And do you have any questions uh, for the future, for Ezra and Nehemiah uh, and, and beyond <laughs> into some of the prophetic uh, literature that we're gonna be getting into soon? Let me know in the comment section down below. Until next time, happy reading and happy studying. Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.